Hello everyone, and thank you for inviting me to PasswordsCon. My name is Erland, and I'm a co-founder at Secure Practice, and we are specialized in the human factors for information security. And we're working with uh, human error and securing uh, people's behavior. And one of the things we are especially interested in is actually feelings. So that's why uh, we're going to talk a bit about feelings here today and uh, just a bit of a contrast to the password hashing and cracking contests you have been doing, all right? So, uh, first of all, uh, how do people behave? Um, for instance, when they're faced with a um, sign telling them what to do or what not to do, um, a sign could convey information and it's not very personal but it's meant for everyone and multiple languages, cultures, etc. Uh, so why is this sign obviously not working? Well, one of the problems here is that people don't have the context they need to actually make an informed decision. Uh, the only information they have is that you shall not pass beyond the sign. Uh, but that is a bit difficult when you're seeing other people walking beyond the sign and uh, especially when you're a tourist you want to uh, not miss out on any views. Uh, so why should you actually care about this sign? Uh, it may all boil down to risk understanding and I don't know why this sign was put up there. But if there was a geologist who had been uh, researching this plateau and finding that it could collapse into the ocean at any time, I would certainly not set my feet uh, out on it. But um, if there was any such information, uh, it was anyway hidden and people would simply make a decision based on the information they have and maybe the feelings they have as well because well, you're there to ex experience a uh, picturesque location and kind of not being able to do that because of a silly sign that feels a bit, uh, well, out of uh, scope for, uh, for what you're responsible for. <clears throat> so, uh, how does this uh, relate to security? Well, um, maybe we heard some or seen some signs telling us not to reuse passwords or maybe use a long password and unique and strong and multi-factor authentication. But these signs, these messages, they don't convey enough information for everyone to follow. So that's why we're not changing any habits by simply putting up these signs alone. Working with people could sometimes really feel a bit like this. Uh, there's so many holes to plug and where to begin and they all keep popping up again and again. And this may lead some people to say that people are actually hopelessly lazy and unmotivated on security. Um, if it was that simple, um, well, people are uh, complex and simple at the same time. And we're going to dive a bit into why these signs are not working on their own and why people are actually making mistakes. And from some research in another field, uh, not very uh, commonly applied in information security, um, actually safety research. Uh, we know that there is a saying, um, it says, um, uh, looked but didn't see and this is all very human we can we can stare at a control window looking for a dangerous situation but if you do this for one hour or six hours you will simply be staring so much you won't see any uh, patterns for uh, alert um, so in process control that's one scenario but actually seeing something visually and comprehending it and understanding it, that is a big topic in these research areas. Uh, so I've been reading a lot about, uh, about uh, what, uh, in particular, James Reason and Sidney Decker have been uh, writing in the area. And 
based on these, I'm just going to take you through seven uh, pretty common uh, or seven categories of human error. And we can use these to, to better create mitigations in our systems. So first of all, we have the slips. Uh, some action is done so often we don't think uh, when we do it. The journalists write this sentence about somebody saying something over and over again. And we write passwords over and over again. Maybe we even paste passwords from our password manager over and over again. And suddenly we paste it into a chat window. Ooh. And our entire team, our company even, uh, is, uh, becomes uh, um, familiar with our password, uh, which is very embarrassing because it was Liverpool 2019. Um, well, it's a pretty common thing you do and it could happen to anyone. But we need to build mechanics, uh, mitigations to stop these uh, events from happening. And it's possible if we analyze these uh, risk scenarios uh, well. Then we have another category and they're a bit more conscious in what we do. It's not too random. Maybe you drive the bus every day, maybe you drive the toll bus every day, but then you drive a new route and there is uh, a lapse in your uh, connection between height and available height. And lapses often occur uh, if we have pretty conscious relationship to what we do, but just forget a piece of the information we need. And an example from the password world could be that we forgot to back up our multi-factor authentication recovery codes. That's an important step of enabling multi-factor authentication, but you, you actually still actually need to remember doing it um, unless the interface really helps us to, to, to do this uh, correctly. Then we have another one, and I'm not trying to make fun of every, anyone here, but uh, with not enough understanding of what we're trying to achieve, if we're enforcing something really difficult and complex on someone who don't have the experience and understanding, there could be some crazy situations uh, coming along. This is why we call uh, rule-based mistakes. And these are uh, based on uh, a routine we're supposed to follow, but uh, our execution is not entirely adequate. Maybe we just misunderstand uh, because we don't have the underlying uh, knowledge. Uh, or knowledge or understanding, there is another one as well. Uh, called knowledge-based mistakes where people simply don't know. So what we're trying to make them do is it's impossible for them because they don't have the knowledge and then the results become entirely random as well. And this is a high risk situation we don't want to uh, involve people in. So we need to make sure our people know enough before they try to do something that is uh, dependent on that knowledge. But common to all of them uh, is we can laugh and say, ha ha ha, and these are all human errors. But then you have the deliberate actions where people actually uh, do call it, um, well, in this next case, uh, errors on purpose. Uh, you know what the policy is supposed to be, uh, how you're supposed to follow the concrete path and not uh, destroy the lawn but you see everyone else doing it and you think it's not that important yourself and it's not your lawn even. So um, this is where somebody tells us how, but we don't care why and people end up with uh, pretty, well, maybe predictable patterns actually. Uh, if we force people into a very square uh, hole for passwords, then uh, and in addition, force them to renew their passwords, then we will also see that they do this in a very predictable way. These routine errors uh, can also be done in 
kind of less repeated uh, ways. Uh, for instance, when you have a special situation, um, you're trying to improvise, but you really don't have a good enough understanding to improvise in a good way, then you make these kind of mistakes. And calling it this uh, maybe a shortcut, uh, there is time pressure, and time pressure is uh, enemy of uh, good very often, uh, where you uh, see how a culture, for instance, in a company uh, would require people to uh, make security less of a priority, and um, they will also then breed uh, risky situations uh, just like this, simply because they have to. They have very tight deadlines, so they need to just send an entire database with personal information and plain text passwords because they don't have time to learn how to do it properly, right? So this is uh, a problem uh, that w with culture actually, and you need to improve culture to improve these situations. And then finally, we have the exceptional errors where people improvise and actually could make the really um, uh, good uh, exception uh, because uh, there is no uh, procedure for doing this right. There is no, uh, no truth in what is the best outcome. Uh, we're putting in the situation where we need to improvise and actually people with a good understanding of risk are very often well able to make good informed decisions even in the stressful situations, um, although uh, there is also a risk that things could go wrong. But in that case, you wouldn't want to blame them because this is, after all, an exceptional situation and uh, the outcome could have been uh, very good as well. Um, so, when we learn about these errors, uh, we see a very clear difference between the uh, kind of, um, the, there is some, of course, some degree of carelessness maybe here, but then there is the, the uh, malicious it intent, and then very often there are other factors that drive our behavior and uh, some very human factors as well. Uh, there is actually a very human uh, reason for uh, not making security a priority every time because uh, if we always uh, were making everything a priority then there, nothing would be a priority. So we as humans we think about priorities and we make these cost-benefit trade-offs actually in secure behavior and based on risk understanding uh, we do better or worse. Um, but still, it is very human to make these trade-offs and it's not only a matter of best practice, but it's actually a matter of very much about communicating best practice to allow people to really comprehend uh, why and uh, how they should make this a priority. And so uh, some research has actually, actually been made on uh, setting up this kind of a, a, a cost benefit budget, a compliance budget really, where you outweigh the negative, the cost with positive uh, benefits. So just to summarize the costs quickly, you have the cognitive and physical load, writing a long password requires some physical effort and remembering a complex password requires thinking. Um, if you're embarrassed, that's negative because you forgot your password. Maybe it was in an importing meeting and you couldn't get the customer because you lost access to your own data. Uh, there was a lot of has hassle and you found yourself unavailable. Uh, for the positive side, you see that people are able to avoid consequence and find uh, protection from actually being directly responsible if something goes wrong, if they are following policy. And also then protection from sanctions is kind of a, well, it, it's a bit of a negative driver to a positive thing, but it's uh, slightly better than fear, as we'll talk about a bit later. 
Um, this is about protection and finding that positive uh, driving force for security. And there's also another factor, it's not in the original research, but I found that many people appreciate being able to stop cybercrime because nobody likes criminals. Nobody likes uh, to see that cybercrime is winning and we want to fight that. So if you can be a part of the resistance, so to say, then that is a positive driving factor for people for good security. If we have a couple of practical examples on the cost benefits, then we, we say create the secure passwords. Okay, there is some cost here, complexity, many rules to remember, difficult requirements, you need to do a lot of thinking. But on the positive side, best practice has come become quite much easier um, and uh, there is single sign-on to reduce the need for repeated input and maybe risk-based authentication to avoid uh, repeated two-factor uh, authentication on um, well-known devices. So here we have uh, a cost range really. Um, well, quite in the middle of the range maybe and uh, some people who have a good risk understanding would have a lower cost for this uh, while people with a lower risk understanding would uh, experience a higher cost. If we then move to changing a password then you kind of get the complexity repeated uh, over and over again and in addition it feels unnecessary because you're only changing a number in your password and then it's yeah, um, you're writing it wrong when you change, uh, so you're kind of uh, suddenly locking yourself out of the account and need to spend time on resolving your access instead. And this has a higher cost than simply creating a strong password. So we want to avoid this. We don't want to give users unnecessary cost, and that's why we see that these, uh, these recommendations have luckily been changing. Uh, lately. So uh, again there is a range of cost here but it's higher. Um, but if we look at the more uh, motivational side uh, because I, I, I find there is room for improvement here as well on the, the, the motivation that people have. So you increase their risk understanding and they will find that there is, uh, it's easier to use resources to be secure. But how to make them, uh, give them higher risk understanding? Uh, how to motivate this? Well, it could be very simple in terms of the words you use. Uh, here is a study from a hospital where they wanted more hand wash among healthcare personnel. So you see these two messages. One part of the hospital, they use the first one, hand hygiene prevents you from catching disease, while the other part of the hospital use the other message, hand hygiene prevents patients from catching disease. So I usually ask the audience, uh, what do you think was the most effective uh, message? And uh, I cannot see you, but try to uh, take a guess. Uh, people are not you know, always in agreement here, um, but actually what the researchers found, the most impactful message was the last one. Because the experts, uh, they believed they were somewhat safe, <laughs> but they knew that they cared about the patients. And one thing is when you care about yourself, yes you do kind of what it takes to take care of yourself, but maybe if you need to take care of others, maybe you feel a bigger responsibility in some aspects. And this is an example where one simple word did have an effect and quite impactful as well uh, on the degree of hand wash. So motivating based on external factors and other people, maybe your employer or your colleagues or um, your customers, your company's customers, uh, protecting their information is a bigger driving force for good security than actually you avoiding some hassle. So uh, 
This also ties into what I promised in the beginning. We're going to talk about feelings and feelings are a very interesting topic and it contains a lot of different factors and we can't kind of uh, go through all of the complexity of feelings. But there is a study on how feelings for security is related to risk understanding and then kind of output in f as, as kind of um, um, risk category for for people actually um, so if we if we see uh, people who have uh, very positive feelings for security and high degree of risk understanding maybe these are people we call usually champions and champions are good they breed positive practices among also their colleagues and they uh, exert a good uh, positive vibe that this is important and is it possible as well. On the opposite side we find the reckless, those who are negative on feelings uh, and they have a very low risk understanding. Um, maybe if they had higher risk understanding they would be plain circumventers. Uh, they don't care about the rules. They're not the worst in class in actually performing security wise, but they don't want to follow policy. The problem with them is that they often uh, tend to attract followers as well, like the champions and the followers may be reckless ones who turn into even more reckless ones or even naive ones who believe that this is sound secure. So, Let's do it, but they don't have the understanding to, to reject their advice. And the naive ones are positive and uh, possibly they could be uh, trained for better uh, behavior um, and they will receive your messaging almost regardless of uh, how you communicated, as long as it, it feels helpful. So if they are um, naive, uh, we have a good chance at increasing their risk understanding. And I'll just bring in apathic ones to the mix here because they're quite a bit in the middle here. Um, thing is, we want people to increase their risk understanding. But in order to do that, we actually need to bring about some positive feelings because if they're negative, they won't listen to us anyway. So we want to give them positive feelings about security and then we want to increase their risk understanding as well, but afterwards. So you cannot expect reckless people or circumventers to listen to your uh, one-sided messages or signs that you put up. Uh, you actually need to get into their work life and see why are they circumventing, uh, why do we have this recklessness, uh, have they not received the tools they need, uh, have they not been trained, um, etc. We can maybe use some innovative tricks actually to improve the emotional situation of users, to involve them and to give them credit when they actually achieve the desired security behavior. Uh, one example is uh, Fortnite uh, online game, uh, millions of players worldwide. And they introduced this uh, bonus that you received if you enabled multi-factor authentication on your account. Then you would get this very exclusive emote, uh, the dance that you see, which is very cool to show off to your friends. And everybody asks, hey, where did you get that? You can't buy it for money. You actually have to improve security. So this is a good example of where gamification actually can help us. And again, appeal to some different um, human uh, aspects uh, apart from what we're maybe usually uh, used to. Um, what has been commonly used is what we call fair appeals. Uh, you use fair to drive uh, the desired behavior. <clears throat> this has a number of drawbacks uh, really because fear is a bit of an uncontrolled emotion and it's difficult to get predictable behavior from fear. 
So in many situations, people will actually uh, back off from uh, whatever message you have because they don't want to be exposed to fear. Uh, they enter kind of denial mode and this is not where we want people to be. In addition, they respond more to the feelings of fear rather than in informa information they have uh, and knowledge um, because when you have fear, you respond more to instinct. So what we want is people to respond to knowledge and positive feelings. And what we can kind of summarize all of this with is what can be called self-efficacy. I think this is a key word in what we're trying to accomplish. We want people to believe that they are able to protect themselves online. We want people to believe that this is useful and this is a cost benefit, beneficial uh, kind of uh, piece of math <laughs> where people see that this actually stops cybercrime and their efforts are important as well. Um, they are a part of it and they have a responsibility and they are able to execute on that responsibility. So be it passwords or um, suspicious emails that they are able to achieve uh, a state uh, of kind of being secure and, and feeling accomplished and empowered. That is, I think, a very important design goal for us as security professionals. So try to let that shine through and decide uh, systems with even more empathy and even greater benefit, perceived benefit for your users.